that I am speaking and you're able to hear. I learned this in Punta Venas, Chile, in Spanish, and that's a private translation. But I'm going to sing it in Spanish now. I'm just saying, who's it as you make it? This is the day when all languages can be spoken. Yo te amo y me puedes oír, tan cerca como yo te amo y me puedes oír. Much closer than I am speaking, and you're able to hear. I told you often I learned that in, in Chile. The, Augusto Pinochet was the president. And in the Catholic Church where I was worshiping, they sang that song as the Caballoneros, which were sort of the militarized police and machine guns, who stepped outside the cathedral. <laughs> and they were singing, God is real.
I remember when you gave me the water. I remember those days like yesteryear. I lost my head in a darkening with fear. Bones hot and shot, burning flame with angry desire. My hand to the trigger, I was ready to fire. Touch grace from a loving hand. Just a touch of grace from a loving hand. Just a touch of grace so I could understand. I was lying awake in a cold, dark cell. Every day was a maddening hell. Insanity grips me as the hours fly by. I swear to God, I was ready to die. When the holy spark that was living in you was passed to me, and I suddenly knew how it feels when a stranger gives you a hand. And the love of our Jesus covers the land. And I remember when you, I remember when you, I remember when you. Touch of grace from a loving hand. Sing with me, just a touch of grace. Just a touch of grace from a loving hand. Just a touch of grace. Just a touch of grace so I could understand. I remember you. I remember when you. I remember when you. Today is Pentecost, which is traditionally known as the birthday of the church. So church, happy birthday. We celebrate that with a plethora of red, as we all can see. And it's a day when we honor the gifts that have descended on the community. And I'd like to thank those as we get started for the beautiful gifts of flowers that have come from so many others' gardens, specifically thank you to Dorothy for her contributions to those. And thank you to the deacons for setting up this gorgeous space. Isn't this stunning? Yes, thank you, you. Thank you all. We are gathered here to honor the triune God and of joyfulness, a day of celebration. I even am told there will be some ice cream outside afterwards. Thank you to Sandy and Bob Steady for Yay. that. It's a joyful day. Yeah, it's a joyful day. And on this joyful day God has made, we gather here. We gather here to seek God. We bring all that we are. We bring who we are to this space. With this spirit in mind, let us prepare our hearts and minds together for worship. Lord, prepare.
responding to injustices and hoping for peace. This call to transformation is hardly an easy one. Come, Holy Spirit, and grant us understanding and wisdom. As, As we call one another to worship, we also call out to God, Come, Holy Spirit, come. This is a new hymn. So let me just get the groove. It's in five floors. And let us join together in our unison prayer of confession as it can be found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Yeah. Holy One, we live our lives day after day. And if we are honest about this, so often those days pass by in a blink with scarcely a thought towards how we can share your love with others. We can so quickly become like children, full of joy, but also hindered 
by our own shortcomings. Forgive, Forgive us, we pray. Realign our vision, our mission, our promises. Realign our time, our priorities, our finances. Realign our lives so that we can share your loving vision for this world. It is in your name we pray. Beloved of God, hear the good news as it comes to us from the scriptures, that all sin and all fall short of God's glory, which is to say that we all miss the mark. And so when we miss the mark, God is ever faithful. For just as often as we mess up, so often does God show up in our messiness and claim us again as God's own children, beloved people. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven in the Holy Spirit. We are given a chance after another chance after another to do well by God. And even when we mess up then too, God is a God of grace and forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Scripture today is uh, from Acts 2, verses 1 to 21. It's called The Coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as a fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Estaban de visita en Jerusalén judíos piadosos, procedentes de todas las naciones de la tierra. Al oír aquel bullicio, se agolparon y quedaron todos pasmados porque cada uno los escuchaba hablar en su propia en su propio idioma desconcertados y maravillados decían no son galileos todos estos que están hablando cómo es que cada uno de nosotros los oye hablar en su lengua materna Partos, Medos, Elamitas, habitantes de Mesopotamia, de Judea y de Capadocia, del Ponte y de Asia, de Frigia y de Pamphylia, de Egipto y de las regiones de Libia, cercanas a Sirene, visitantes llegados de Roma, judíos y prosélitos, cretenses y árabes. Todos por igual los oímos proclamar en nuestra propia lengua las maravillas de Dios. Desconcertados y perplejos se preguntaban, ¿qué quiere decir esto? Ah, oh, a ese momento, los juifs pieux venus de toutes les nations du monde séjournaient à Jérusalem. En entendant ce bruit, ils accoururent en foule et furent saisis de stupeur. En effet, chacun d'eux les entendait parler dans la propre langue. Dans leurs étonnements, ils n'en croyaient pas leurs oreilles. Et disaient, voyant, ces gens qui parlent ne viennent-ils pas tous de Galilée Comment se fait-il donc que, que nous les entendions s'exprimer chacun dans, son, dans sa, la, euh, sa langue maternelle? <rire> Andere von uns kommen aus Mesopotamien, Judea, Kapodizien, 
Pontus und der Provinz Asia, aus Phrygien, Pamphylien und aus Ägypten, aus der Gegend von Kyrene in Lydien und selbst aus Rom. Hier sind Juden, äh, Kreter und Araber. Jeder von uns hört diese Männer in seiner eigenen Sprache von Gottes großen Taten reden. Bestürzt und ratlos fragte einer den anderen, was soll das bedeuten? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not, these are not drunk, for as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. <coughs> no, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old man, men shall dream dreams. Even my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May God bless these words to our understanding. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, take our minds and bring us your thoughts. Take our eyes and help us to see. Take our hands and work through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The church is great when it's working right. When everyone is happy and healthy, when the buildings are up to fire code, when the money is pouring in, when children are on the waiting list for church school, everything seems to be just fine. The church is great when it's working right. And even when the church isn't working perfectly, still, I think we can get along pretty well. History has shown that we can maneuver through logistical difficulties of having different groups clamoring for the same space. We can manage having leaders step up and step down from various tasks. We can get along with each other most of the time, even when we differ in our viewpoints. Even when the church isn't working perfectly, we can still make it work pretty well. But it is in those moments when something unexpected comes and smacks the church upside the head, that I'm inclined to believe we can sometimes forget who we are and whose we are. Something so jarring that we lose our sense of direction and find ourselves floundering in murky waters. What do we do now? Something like the sudden death of a loved one. In the aftermath, we usually do pretty well by that, I think, as the church. But in that moment, we flounder. Something like a deer that runs into a glass window and decimates church property. Ah, oh, geez, what are we going to do now? And this becomes more prophetic, right? When certain things in our culture smack us upside the head. Something like a racist or a sexist or an ageist or a misogynistic remark where the invasion of what should be a safe community cuts into the heart of one's soul. Something like a gun threat within a much used building here in our very town. Something like a pandemic with, which robs us of our ability to plan our future. 
Our church family has been rocked these past few years, a time or two, with each one of the things I mentioned and others. And in the midst of all of this, there can feel like a space of mourning, a space of loss. Loss is hard, and it takes its toll, and it is when our faith is stretched in new ways. It is when we as the church are called to respond with more energy than we have. Okay, we need to bolster ourselves up and be the church and respond to these things in ways that are faithful to our call. Many of you know I began my ministry career over 10 years ago as a hospital chaplain. St. Luke's in Bethlehem, PA, and Robert Wood Johnson in New Jersey were both, are both level one trauma center hospitals, which meant that in addition to visiting the sick and dying patients and their loved ones, I was responsible for spending time with families whose loved ones had been in serious accidents. These people would come into the trauma rooms bloodied and laden with anxiety, if conscious at all, and their family members had to hear from me, sometimes hour after hour after hour, that their loved one was still being worked on, that it would take a little longer for the test results, that it would be a while yet until they could see them. Waiting, waiting, waiting. That hurry up and wait phase. What has struck me about hurrying up to wait is that the masks, not these, but another kind of masks, are gone. I mean the mask of, I'm doing fine, thanks, which can so easily be put on during the week at work, at home with our families, and even, yes, in church on Sundays. The I'm fine mask, though, has no place in the hospital. In traumatic moments, we are who we really are. We are utterly transparent and utterly vulnerable. It is this vulnerability, which we would so much prefer to hide, that rears its head when hard things happen. When we hear news coming from Texas about the deaths of 19 children and two teachers, among many other tragedies. I think many of us have experienced this kind of stripping away of that I'm fine thanks mask quite a bit in the past couple of years. The COVID-19 pandemic has been tragic. I know many of us have found joys in that midst of sorrow. It's uh, an interesting time for the church. There's a recalibration of our spirits that we want to take with us after the pandemic is over. But generally speaking, this has been a challenging time. What's interesting to me about that is something that occurred to me as I was reading our Pentecost story again for this week. Those who were present at Pentecost knew something about tragedy, about trauma, and about waiting. In the chapter just before I read for us this morning, Jesus has ascended to heaven, leaving his disciples alone yet again. Imagine for a moment that you are in that space. You are one of Jesus' followers, First, you were a witness to his horrible crucifixion. Right before your very eyes, someone you love and have followed for three years is tortured and killed. You are naturally grieving the loss of your friend. Then the friend returns in the joy of the resurrection, but he's only in your midst for a few weeks. Then he weaves again. Can you imagine the pain and the sorrow and the joy and the confusion that Jesus' friends must have felt. What is often forgotten, I think, about Pentecost, we celebrate the birthday of the church, as I said, but we often forget that the disciples were in mourning and they were confused. What is going on now? Images of the crucifixion could not have been so easily erased from their minds. And after the ascension, Jesus is gone again. The future of their little group was hardly certain. Judas, their right-hand man, had died. And even Peter, a key leader among them, had previously denied knowing Jesus. And it sounds like there's this reconciliation, but no one else was privy to that. Their group, the early church, was not working right. 
They had been cut to the core by loss, and they were floundering. The disciples are told by Jesus when he ascends into heaven to wait. For all of you who are parents, how easy is it to tell your child to just be patient and wait? How about on Christmas Eve, when they are anticipating the good things that are to come? My brother and I were so bad at this that my parents had to establish a rule, no waking mommy and daddy before 5 a.m. on Christmas morning. And even then, I remember looking at the clock and learning how to tell time by that day because I was counting down the minutes to when the joy could start. How easy is it to wait? Adults may hide it better, but many of us are just as impatient. Waiting does not come easily to many of us. The disciples, right before Pentecost, decided to fill their waiting time by selecting a replacement for Judas so that there could be 12 disciples again. This is a scripture reference that they pull out of the Old Testament to somehow justify what they're doing. But just as a piece of trivia, does anyone remember this new disciple's name? Matthias. Matthias, very good. Don't feel bad if you did not remember that, because guess what? His name doesn't show up ever again in the scriptures. <laughs> the disciples were filling their waiting time with what they thought was important or what could fill the time. And by learning the difficult lesson of patience, they had to learn. Just like us today, the disciples did not know how to respond to the times of waiting and mourning. How often do we fill up our hurry up and wait time with purposeful, intentional activities? How often do we fill that time with white noise of televisions and computers and smartphone screens and car stereos and a hurried pace of life? that never really seems to slow down. The hurry up and wait phase is one that is fraught with anxiety and fear, and we do what we can to kind of put one foot in front of the other. The hurry up and wait time can be found in the best of our churches today and in the lives of the best of Christians. Okay, so up until this point, I've painted a pretty bleak picture of the church and of the Christian life as a whole. So some of you may be thinking, geez, isn't this Pentecost Sunday? Did Jill just skip a week somewhere? Isn't this the birthday? Where's the uplifting message? What is happening? This is a very good question. It is Pentecost, and there is very, very good news to celebrate. But for those of you who have felt a tug at your heart in the past few minutes, if something I said had resonated with you, this sermon is for you. For the hope as Christians is not in the early church, nor is it in the church today, nor is it in our individual faith. Our hope is in God. Sometimes having this hope is really hard, especially after we have experienced trauma or difficult times. The hurry up and wait phase is really hard. God knows this. When we acknowledge the pain and hopelessness we live with at times, we can finally recognize the hope that comes only with God's grace through the light of the Holy Spirit. In our Christian faith, the joy of the resurrection shines brightly, but we can only see its presence if we have previously been lost in the dark days of the crucifixion. Just when the early church was not quite working right, they're gathered around, sort of waiting, not really sure what they're waiting for, something happens. The Holy Spirit comes to those gathered. And it comes with full force. A strong wind, tongues of fire, people speaking different languages, and not only speaking them, but understanding them. This was not a time when people were versed in other languages, folks. There is chaos and confusion among the followers and the surrounding crowds. There is a cacophony of noise that is somehow understandable. Some express utter confusion as to how this is all possible. Others suppose that these people are drunk. Peter, first of all people, rises to the occasion and responds in verse 22 and following, You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with deeds and powers, wonders and signs, 
that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law, but God raised him up, having freedom from death, because it was impossible for him to be held. This Jesus God raised up, therefore is exalted at the right hand of God. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured this out so that you can both see and hear. Beloved of God, this is the good news. Jesus is risen and we are not left alone to figure out life for ourselves. That was never God's intention. Nor are we left to figure it out for ourselves how to be the church. In the midst of our grief, in the midst of our floundering and our murky waters, in the midst of the church community perhaps not working perfectly, in the midst of our hurry up and waiting for better days, in the midst of all of our anxious frenetic we need to have 12 disciples, we need to have this number of people on committees, we need to have it set up in this way. This is the quorum, this is the church, here are the people. Okay, in the midst of all of that, a light filled with passion and hope comes in our midst and comes to each one of us. Our hope is not in what we can do. Our hope is not in the people gathered together to be the church, as hopeful as I am about this group. This is a beautiful sight. But our hope is in the presence that arrives by fire and comes to rest on each individual person. At Pentecost, each person is specifically touched by this fire. The Holy Spirit, the spark of God in the depths of our very beings. So when those depths become dark and murky, God can respond with light and with hope. Waiting patiently for something better to come goes against our very nature. We are little children on Christmas Eve. We are like the followers just before Pentecost. We don't always know what to do next. It is easy to become discouraged in our waiting, but even when we cannot hope, even when we can't wait with patience, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us can. The Holy Spirit is often referred to in Greek as Sophia, which is a feminine noun and connotes wisdom. If our world needs anything today, I'm inclined to think it might be wisdom. Wisdom is not smarts. Wisdom is a centered awareness and insight which comes from God. The early disciples understood every language that was uttered around them. They had centered awareness and insight into the people around them. By cultivating things like empathy and compassion and honest love for everyone around us, do we not become translators through the Holy Spirit's wisdom? As we learn the languages people are speaking in our world, if we can understand where they are, the call is then to translate God's love so that they can catch it too. I am persuaded that that is our call today, to hone our inner wisdom, to listen for the spirit at work in the world, and to become holy translators for others. At Pentecost, arguably the greatest revival in history, the church's numbers go from 120 members to over 3,000 in one day. That would be interesting to experience. <laughs> but the numbers are so less important in this story than is the call to take the surprising arrival of the Spirit, to understand it, to be attuned enough to each other so that we hear it and see that flame and translate it for those who haven't yet caught on. We are all in the hurry up and wait phase, waiting for something, a brighter future, something in our lives to improve, some other thing for which we will turn the corner. As baptized Christians, as the church, it is our job to continue to remember the presence of God's fire, to be transformed by it, 
and to translate it to others. More important than growth in numbers is growth in depth, in spirit, in faith, in hope. The church is great when it's working right, but in those moments when it isn't, God is greater. God will one day transform our hope. God will one day make all things new. God will one day create a world which does not have such tragedies that rock us and shake us as some of the news in the past few weeks understandably has. Through it all, may we endeavor to listen and to be watchful for that spirit's catching glow. And then when we see it, may we endeavor to translate it for others. In the name of God, Jesus, and yes, the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, 
Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, ja. Ja. I like the truth of all. After Jesus was resurrected, the scripture tells a story of him encountering two disciples walking to a village called Emmaus. They invited Jesus, whom they did not know was Jesus, to table, where he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they knew him. They knew him, and they knew that this story, within their stories, was too good for them to keep to themselves. They retraced their miles of steps, even though it was nighttime, and thus began a new story and a new journey. This meal is the joyful feast of the people of God. All of God's beloved children are invited to come to remember that they are worthy and beloved, deserving of full lives to remember that they have enough and that they are enough. This table is for all who are spiritually hungry. It is for all who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. In company with all of God's children in every time and place, we come to this table to be filled again with nourishing food and with the power of the Holy Spirit which we carry with us when we depart from this place. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, eternal God. You have created the heavens and the earth. You have given breath to every living thing. We thank you for making us in your image, for deeming us worthy to be called your children, 
and for continuing to form and sanctify us by your divine love and grace. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, your Son, who was born, lived, died, and rose again in victory over the grave, and who calls us into the beloved community of your people. We recall a new Christ's teachings, not as mere niceties, but as words that hold transforming and life-giving power. We await together his return at the end of history. We take courage and comfort from the steadfast presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Grant us eyes to see and ears to hear your work within us, such that we can continue to grow in wisdom and translate your love into the world today. We pray for all of those for whom you, the triune God, also hold close this day. We pray especially for Ukraine, for those enshrouded by war and fear. We pray for Uvalde, Texas, especially for those who buried their children there this past week. We pray for all who have been victims of gun violence. May they know your presence even in the midst of their trauma and grief. We pray for those who enact legislation. May you guide their hearts, minds, hands, and spirits. And we pray for others here at home who are living with their own fears, traumas, losses, and struggles. I now invite us to either pray silently or aloud to bring people, places, and situations to the table and to God this day. God, we know that you hear the prayers of our hearts, both those spoken and those that are too tender for the spoken word. We pray all of this as we say the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, and on the eve of death on the cross, Jesus was gathered with the disciples. He knew that they were about to embark on something different. He knew that they needed words, a story to sustain them. And so he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, take and drink this. This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For by eating this bread and drinking this cup, we proclaim Christ's death. We know what it is to sit in the waiting with him. We also celebrate his life and the resurrection, the hope that can come after lying in wait, and we await his coming again. With each morsel of bread and each sip of the cup, we take in love and forgiveness so that we can then take it out into this world. Holy Spirit, flame of love, come. 
We ask you to come and bestow your presence on this bread and wine, on our gifts and on us. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, <coughs> the church, your people. It is in your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Through the broken bread. <coughs> <laughs> 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 Through whispers of hope, we proclaim Christ's death. We celebrate his resurrection. I invite us to now eat and drink with joy in our hearts. <clears throat> Soldiers came to arrest him. 
One of the disciples was unnamed, but I suspect it might have been Peter, because Peter was always the one who would act before he thought. Pulled out his sword, the weapon of choice in those days. He struck off the ear of one of the soldiers. Jesus asked him to put the sword away. And then he healed the ear of the soldier. What would have happened if instead of pulling out a sword, Peter or the disciple pulled out an AR-15? I hope there will be some kind of legislation to prevent these kinds of weapons. Even if the marksman who is using it has a bad aim, the type of bullet used, the number of bullets in the clip, the vibration and speed of that bullet, even if it misses the vital organ, causes tremendous damage inside the human body. Just a quick reminder that Wednesday is council meeting. Thank you. Now I'm wearing orange precisely for that reason. Um, I have three announcements. Wow, we're getting together this month. Um, you know what, you love it. Women of Woodmont come to my house on Friday, June 17th, 6.30 until whenever. Um, if you can bring something to share, great. If you can't, no worries. The important thing is for you to come over, enjoy, have a good time, fellowship. We always have a good time. Um, June 18th, which is the next day, Saturday, from 10 to 4 p.m. on the Milford Green, is the Juneteenth celebration, which is the celebration that two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, finally people who had been trafficked in Texas were allowed to go free. Um, so we celebrate that. It'd be great to have a good presence there and celebrate that historic event. And then the next day, which is also Father's Day, on Sunday, good trouble moments are coming back. So I will see you, or Nina will, or whoever in the church will. So thank you. Oh, I got one too. Okay. Sorry, I didn't get in line. It was over here. Sorry. But you really, you need the camera? So I just want to. We're going to serve. Pray, heal each other. Salam alaikum, be salam. We're gonna serve, pray, heal each other. Salam alaikum, peace and shalom. Shalom, salam alaikum, peace and shalom. Shalom, salam alaikum, peace and shalom. Interfaith Service Day is Sunday, August 7th. That's the song that I need the flash mob singers to learn. And we're gonna flash mob some restaurants and places in New Haven and pass out flyers and get them onto the green to paint the giant billboard with us, which is going to have children just thrilled because our theme is Surf, Pray, Heal. And so the images of the children of different different backgrounds just rejoicing. So please uh, sign up. I'm going to have a sign-up sheet. I need some people that want to do a Habitat for Humanity build on that Sunday with our Jewish and Muslim brothers and sisters. We're going to go to the beach and clean the beach. We're going to have all sorts of fun things. So please... Sunday, August 7th, your worship service will be there. Amen? Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Sunday, August 7th, the worship service will be there. I will be here in case anyone forgets and shows up here. I'm going to send you out that way, though, so feel free to <laughs> go there first. It'll save you some steps. Uh, I have a couple of announcements for us. They're a bit kind of hither and yon, so bear with me. But first, I want to thank all who attended yesterday's leadership retreat. I see a number of folks from the church. Thank you all. There were 13 of us there. It was a joyful gathering, and I think we had a lot of fun, a lot of laughter, and some good reflection, too, on who we are, what we bring to this space, and who we are called to be in the world. So thank you all for that. You'll probably be, probably be hearing some updates from that time in the time to come. Uh, you've heard a couple of times today uh, the tragedy in Uvalde, Texas has been mentioned and named, and Reverend Art shared uh, some deep wisdom about that as well. If that is something that's striking your heart, let me know. Um, I am in the midst of pondering what we might do as a church, how we might respond. That'll be a conversation at council on Wednesday as well. 
But if you have any thoughts, feel free to, to come to me and talk to me about that. Uh, next Sunday is New Member Sunday, and mm -hmm. I will be joining along with Rosa Richardson, uh, so that'll be fun. So, yeah, it'll be a joyful Sunday. Please do come if you can. We will actually finish the service with an all-church photo. Uh, so you don't want to miss that. You need not be a member to be in that photo. We're just happy to have you, so please do come and join us for that. Uh, after that, there will also be a meeting. Some of you may have received the All Church email that mentions updates to our personnel policy. Uh, those are going into effect very soon. And while, because it's a personnel policy, we don't need to have a congregational meeting about it. If anyone has questions or wonderings, feel free to show up next Sunday. Uh, Bettina and I will be around to chat with you about that. And also, I am very delighted, you may remember a couple of weeks ago, we passed out Bibles to our, uh, some of our Sunday schoolers, and uh, a couple couldn't be there that Sunday, but we have one here today, so I'd like to invite Ella to come forward. We have, yes. we have a Bible for you, Ella, and we also have a book, Brave Girls, Better Than Perfect. So we are so glad to have you. I hope you enjoy these. Welcome, welcome, thank you. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. And just a quick addendum, uh, Jill thanked us for the retreat, but I'd really like to thank Jill for yes. all the planning and energy. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. And we'll close the service with hymn number 391, In the Midst of New Dimensions. <laughs>
Thank you. 